Hi, and welcome to the Restorative Wellness Clinician's Corner, a video series exclusively for functional health professionals, where we interview the top experts in the latest research, products, tools, and best practices for getting your clients exceptional results. Welcome, everyone, to today's um, episode of the RWS Clinician's Corner. I am super, super excited about today's guest, which is Dr. Bryce Applebaum. Dr. Bryce, can you say hi so everyone, your video lights up? Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me here. So great to have you here. So I'm going to read your formal bio, and then I want to hear stories. So... Dr. Applebaum is on a mission to change the way the world views vision. He believes that there is much more to vision than just 2020 eyesight and has developed programs to retrain the brain to revise the eyes. Dr. Applebaum has been featured on the front page of USA Today, on CBS, and in the New York Times Magazine, Beth Bethesda Magazine, and as the cover story of OT Advance. He was the 2022 recipient of the Future of Health Award at the Mindshare Leadership Summit. If any of you were there, you saw his incredible talk. Um, he shared the stage with Dr. Joe Dispenza, Marie Forleo, and JJ Virgin. And you might have heard him as a podcast guest um, recently on Mind Body Green, Chris Kresser's Revolution Health Radio, and Cynthia Thurlow's Everyday Wellness. Dr. Applebaum is a pioneer in neurooptometry, passionate about unlocking life's potential through vision. His expertise includes reorganizing the visual brain post-concussion to return to learn and return to life, remediating visual developmental delays, interfering with reading and learning, and enhancing visual skills to elevate sports performance. He's the owner and managing doctor at Applebaum Vision PC, a private practice specializing in vision therapy and rehabilitation with offices. And I realize I don't know how to say Beth's, Beth's da -da? Beth, how do you Beth's say that? Bethesda. Bethesda. Oh, <laughs> close. That's all right. <laughs> Not even remotely close, but <laughs> <laughs> Bethesda and Annapolis, Maryland. He's the founder and CEO of ScreenFit, which he's going to tell us a little bit about later. Um, he's the premier eye doctor, created an online vision training program designed to transform tired, strained, and blurry computer eyes into HD clear vision. Uh, Dr. Applebaum. Can I call, what do you want me to call you for this interview? I know you as Bryce. How, what do you want to call me? What, Bryce what, Works. what do you want me to call you? Bryce, Bryce Works. Works. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Welcome. So excited to have you here. I would love to start with your personal story, which has some pretty deep family roots. I think, you know, a lot of us are kind of used to the typical practitioner story of like, oh, here's my healing journey. And then I, I got into this, but this started really, really young for you. And this is quite a family affair. Can you share a little bit about that? Absolutely. I'd first love to start and just say, I remember first time we met, we got mm -hmm. off the bus in, in uh, I think it was Park City. And yeah. you were telling me all about this group. And I am just so honored to be here because I, I know what you're creating because these practitioners are so lucky to have you as, as their leader and honored to be here. So thank you all for having me. Um, so my story really begins early on. Uh, first grade, I was there was this fall afternoon. I can remember as if it was yesterday at Carter Rock Springs Elementary School and we we're playing soccer. We we're playing the Purple People Leaders. And there was this moment that is just so clear that has stuck within my mind forever where I'm this lone defender as these three attackers are on a breakaway. It's just me, the goal behind me, and they're coming right at me. I completely froze. Uh, it's like my legs were stuck in quicksand and these guys just blow right past me and, and easily score. And I remember feeling completely lost in space and afraid and helpless and like I let all my teammates down, just giving the goal away to this other team. And at the time I had visual developmental delays. So what that meant was I had trouble focusing my eyes. I had poor depth perception. My eyes didn't work well together as a team. And it really caused me to, to freeze in moments where I should have just sprung into action. Um, so that night I at the dinner table with my parents, I had a complete breakdown Everything came pouring out in tears. I shared how I didn't know what to do on the field, where to be, how in the classroom I, I couldn't see what the teacher was even writing on the board. And I often had to ask my friends, 
you know, what, what was up there and would pretend even sharpen my pencil, those old school pencil sharpeners on the wall there. So I could get a, a peek at the, that was on the chalkboard. Right. Um, and I always worked hard in school, but I was a reluctant reader and I flew through other sub subjects like, like math, where I had strengths to try and make up for my deficiencies with reading. And really because of my vision, I had just negative confidence. Uh, I felt like a turtle retreating into my shell with so many aspects of life. Uh, and like you shared, fortunately, my mother was an occupational therapist. My father, a developmental optometrist. I was born to the perfect parents for me. And it wasn't until really that breakdown that they put the pieces together. And so from that point forward, my parents put a plan of action together to facilitate um, what was necessary for my visual development, overall development, and to really help me soar in life. So for the next several years, I did vision therapy. Uh, we'll learn about what that is. I did sensory integration-based occupational therapy every week. And because of this consistent treatment I received, it really all came together for me uh, in about the fourth grade or so when, when my eyes, my brain, my body finally all started working together as a team. And this confidence that was never there completely emerged. And I became this stud athlete. I started enjoying reading. I to develop interpersonal communication skills and, and turned a disability really into a strength where I could rely on vision and gain an advantage in the world. And so I continued with therapies over time. I obviously have transitioned now from patient to clinician, where for now for decades, I've been studying all of this and evolving vision therapy in terms of innovations, technological applications, practices, protocols, really into what vision therapy is today. And can happily say that what was, you know, we can accomplish in a matter of months, you know, now what was done for me and ye for years before, and we can really help people who've been misdiagnosed with ADD, ADHD, dyslexia, or other learning differences. We can help people who have lazy eyes or eye turns avoid the need for surgery so they can get their life back on track. And uh, those suffering from concussions help them return to learn and, and return to work. Um, and, and students and adults who are with their heads buried in screens and phones all day long with these tech-driven devices experiencing symptoms like headaches and eye strain and, and blurry vision and even nearsightedness from the environment. So uh, like you shared, I, I absolutely feel like I'm on a mission now. Um, I'm here so that others really don't have to struggle the way that I did. And so now my focus is to constantly refine standards of practice of what vision therapy is, making it more accessible, um, working on innovations and being on the leading edge of new technologies and practices that can make our, our field efficient, sustainable and, and accessible. So love this opportunity to, to preach to you guys in, in terms of what, uh, how the, the medical world has let so many people down in terms of misdiagnoses and missed opportunities with, within the visual system. I love that. And it's such a powerful example because when you share that story about you on the soccer field, none of that is what we normally think of to, related to eyesight, right? Like we just think of the standard being in the doctor's office, covering one eye, looking at the chart across the thing and seeing, you know, how little, how small letters we can read. We're not thinking about things like depth perception or eyes working together or how that could impact us in something like sports. So I would love us let's like let's start off kind of with a key definition because you are talking about this specifically about like there's a diff difference between vision and eyesight. So let's just start right there so we all have a common language and then I really want to unpack some of these things because I even I have your questionnaire um <laughs> as a patient okay. going through it and I remember seeing some of these things thinking like oh my gosh, this has something to do with vision. This isn't just like clumsiness or, you know, so I want to unpack some of these specifically, but let's just talk, start off with this very broad definition, the distinction between eyesight and vision. So in, in looking around the Zoom room, I, I see lots of glasses. So clearly somebody here has been to an eye doctor. Um, <laughs> he honestly, healthcare has it all wrong about the eyes. And like you shared, so many doctors are solely focused on just getting you to see those small letters on the bottom of the chart and making sure your eyes are healthy, which are important. 
but that's just a starting point. And there's so much more to vision than just 2020 eyesight. So if we get one take home from today, hopefully we get lots of take homes, but the main one, eyesight and vision are separate entities. Eyesight's the ability to see, whether that's letters on a chart, street signs with the teacher rights on the board in the classroom, Vision is far more complex. Vision is how our eyes move together and to converge and to track and process information and how we derive meaning from everything that's around us in the world and then direct the appropriate action. And so really think of eyesight as glasses, vision as brain. And there is a fix for the majority of vision problems, which are brain problems in something called vision therapy, um, which is really a treatment designed to rewire the software in the brain to change how somebody uses their vision in a way to kind of use our eyes to retrain our brain. So it's kind of like physical therapy for the brain, but through the eyes. Um, but any anyone at any eye exam moving forward, you know, ask, ask about vision, not just eyesight. Ask about the functional skills that are necessary for reading and learning and driving and navigating through space and going up and down stairs and escalators and the dynamic use of our eyes as a team, which supports our eye, brain, and body coordination. Well, I can remember, you know, just the intersection of the, the eyeglasses. So just a very personal story. Um, I mean, I have had my eyes tested many times over the years and my eyes were always 2020. And I remember there came to a point where I would say to my husband, James, at the end of the day, I'd be like, oh my God, my eyes hurt so much. They just feel like they're bleeding and it didn't matter. The blue light blockers, like all of that kind of stuff really didn't matter. And I went to an eye doctor. This is of course, long before I met you. I certainly wish I had known you at that point to know, to ask the right questions. And when I went they said, they actually did, they didn't use the language of vision versus eyesight, but he said, you've got 2020. Well, he actually said you have 2020 vision. So he used that language and he said, but your eyes are pointed in different directions. And so there's this eye strain of constantly put, pulling the two, the two together into focus, which is why your eyes hurt so much at the end of the day. And so their solution for it though, was to give me glasses that wasn't necessarily about eyesight specifically. It was about the, the they gave me those, the prisms, right. That helps to correct for things, which now I've become so dependent on it that I was trying to read the other day. And it's not just that things are blurry. It's that my eyes literally without these glasses cannot focus together. Like words are jumping around. I mean, it's, it's now become like, a, these are a complete crippling crutch. And I know working with you will be able to correct that. So I can use these as like readers, but not as this, this, this crutch. So even I think those you know, those, those eye doctors who are, and I do want to make sure that I ask the question because there's so many different types of eye doctors. I want you to help us navigate that lamps tape too. But um, I think that even those, those who are assessing for things that are more functional in nature, don't do what you're doing, which is correct it functionally. They're giving a tool, they're giving a band aid, right? Um, through glasses to correct. Think of, I mean, any metric, even like blood pressure, if a 100 milligram pill gets you to the target blood pressure and a 10 milligram pill does, in my opinion, always prescribe the 10. Right. Same with glasses. It should be our glasses prescription should be the weakest lenses possible that give the most improvement. That's the most balanced between each side. Eyesight is just a symptom. And not to share too much about what you shared, and I know your visual yeah. history a little, a little too intimately, yeah. but prism just moves where something's located in the world. Yeah. So let's say somebody had an eye turn that's 10 units and it's 10 units, whether you're looking up, down, left or right, we can literally move the world 10 units to where the eye is. But if it's prism that's helping with reading when we have to pull our eyes in or when we're driving, when our eyes have to go out, or if the amount of effort changes depending on how fatigued we are, there's not an amount of prism that can be just changed to meet the demands of life. Mm -hmm. And if it's, we look at eye coordination problems as brain problems, well, if it's addressed on a brain basis, then that crutch you speak of with lenses or glasses or prism is no longer needed to get the right stability and stamina to support, you know, how you're using your visual system in life. It's fascinating and so encouraging. And we need, we need more of you. 
So let's talk about um, some of these things that we don't ever think are related to vision, but are related to vision. And I'm going to list some of the top ones that I highlighted here, um, like falling asleep while reading. I was like, well, isn't that how you fall asleep? <laughs> You read, that doesn't happen to everybody. That was shocking to me. The head tilts or one eye is closed or covered while reading. And I definitely, when I, when I write, I think about that. It's like when I handwrite, my book is at this like almost complete 90 degree angle. My head is at a funny angle. I, I set myself up in a very specific way to write. Or, um, you know, we, you talked about the, um, the, the performance in sports or, you know, one that really surprised me because this is so, I mean, I'm really picking the ones that are, that are very related to me. I'm giving away my health history here, but the clumsy or accident prone and knocking things over. And I always think of myself, I was a dancer for years, you know, I'm a runner. Like I, I have very good body coordination in some ways. And yet I am literally always covered in bruises because I like hit the door as I'm walking out or hit the side of my desk, even though I've done gone up and down from this desk thousands of times, I still misjudge it or like misplacing things like that could be a vision issue. It's not just that I'm forgetful. So tell us like a little bit more about these pieces that we don't think have anything to do with our eyes or our vision. So I, I just listed for tons for you. So pick your yeah, well, and I'm, of course, very biased, but vision is our dominant sensory system, and it should be what's guiding and leading in so many situations in life it's interfering. Just to touch briefly on what you and some of the, the examples you gave, you know, somebody who's tilting their head or tilting the page or adjusting their world to compensate for what their visual system can't provide, you know, it, it's pretty incredible what, what our brains can do to compensate. And let's say somebody has a tendency for one eye to act higher than the other. The most common adaptation would be to adjust our heads so that we don't have to have our eyes do that. Or for a child to be leaning on the desk when they're reading or writing or covering an eye, even if it's hard for the eyes to coordinate together. Um, and, and that's, you know, you can get by with that, but only to a point, depending on what's involved. Um, you know, a lot of what you described relies on depth perception, which is our brain's ability to to see in 3D and to know where we're located in space, where other things are in relation to us. Depth perception is not something that anyone is born with. It comes through life experiences. It comes from learning how to, from an early stage, track and focus and converge and, and, and use our eyes together as a unit. And there's cells in the back of our brain and our visual cortex that only come from two-eyed learning. So at any age, no matter how old we are, if the brain is, if the areas of the brain are there and there's connections to tap into that area, we can develop depth perception and neuroplasticity. Right now I have a 98 year old in treatment developing it for the first time. Obviously we're more malleable the younger we are, but the, the bruises and the, uh, you know, difficulty anticipating and understanding space or catching a ball, you know, if, if it's hard to know where things are, if you're not seeing in 3D, how can you anticipate where they will be? And then if we add movement from ourselves or our world, it becomes that much more unstable. And so often kind of the root cause of a lot of these problems are our brain's ability to use our central and our side vision at the same time. And when the world, be, when we're under stress in general, our pupils get wide and we get this tunnel vision effect and our autonomic nervous system is all out of whack. You guys are all experts in this space. But from a vision standpoint, it also it almost means like you're looking through paper towel holders. So if you're trying to catch a ball like this, or if you're trying to drive like this, and you're all of a sudden aware of everything in the periphery, it be, it can become really scary. And the fragile use of the eyes together can make it so you can't function in, in life the way that you deserve to. So the majority of motion sickness has a visual component that's treatable. The majority of headaches and eye strain and visual fatigue and using reading as a sleeping pill, you know, that that's something that our world is so tech driven and so near, de, near demand dependent. If we don't have the system in place, we either avoid or we adapt and a lot of reading, a lot of near work we can't avoid, but adaptations and maladaptations, that's really the root cause of so many functional vision problems. So incredible. And that idea that depth perception isn't something we're born with. I mean, 
there's there's so many pieces that we could go go into here. So these are, you know, as clinicians, we're, we're thinking about this. Of course, all of us are thinking about this for ourselves. I can see lots of questions here in terms of like the personal situations, but we're going to be thinking about this for our clients as well, right? And so, um, can you can you share with us what are some of the things that you would consider to be common? misdiagnoses or diagnoses that are given without proper consideration to the vision component where we as clinicians want to be thinking about, could this be a piece of this individual's puzzle? And what are some things we could ask further to see, is this something that this person potentially experiences and we should refer. So what what are some of those things? You've kind of hinted at some of them in terms of like headaches and motion sickness, but tell us yeah. more. So there's, I, I guess uh, there's two categories I'm most passionate about. Um, the first being, you know, how vision influences learning and performance in the classroom. And, you know, we talked about vision being our dominant sensory system. It's estimated over 80% of what a child learns in the classroom comes from the visual processing of information. Mm -hmm. And sadly, one in 10 kids has a vision problem significant enough to impact learning. So when a child hasn't developed the visual skills necessary to support what's being asked of them in the classroom or screens or technology are being presented earlier than they're visually ready for, or we're reading in kindergarten when so many are not visually ready, that's when symptoms emerge like losing our place, skipping words, skipping lines, things going blurry and into that of focus. And the medical world is so quick to slap labels on behaviors. And the three most common that I see on a daily basis are ADD, ADHD, and dyslexia. When in my opinion, those are incomplete diagnoses unless functional vision problems have been ruled out because they were hidden before. And it's not like there's a blood test you can take to say, oh yes, you have ADT or ADHD and the majority of symptoms on the DSM-4 classification system for those labels parallel with these symptoms like being distracted when we're reading or being in a classroom with sensory input around here, we've got to pull our eyes up to be able to see what's going on rather than taking in that information without moving our eyes there or relying on our ears in a classroom, not our eyes or being squirmy with desk work or not able to keep our body still as, as we can't keep our eyes steady. And so, so many kids are misdiagnosed and, and adults who then compensate their whole lives with these labels. And it can sometimes even define them when you know, I think the only truthful way to say what portion of a of these symptoms are related to vision versus a biochemical imbalance potentially would be, well, this is all treatable vision-wise. And we see where behavior and attention and um, concentration and, and cognitive capacity lie when all of these huge roadblocks are eliminated. So I think that's a really, really big one where kids who hate to read, struggle in school, or really squirmy with desk work, I would say there's a much higher likelihood that they have a vision problem than that they don't, just based off of where we're seeing vision development these days, especially post COVID, where anyone in this room who has kids, you're, they're on tablets and screens way more than they should be. Um, and so I think that's a big area. And then really the second area is concussion recovery. Um, you know, there's, I know this is a big jump, but there's more areas of our brain dedicated to processing vision than all of our other senses combined, not eyesight, but vision. Yeah. And two thirds of the neurons entering our brain come from our eyes. So it's kind of impossible to have a head injury and not have vision be impacted. It's just a matter of at what level. And then suddenly kind of the previously normal activities of life, like going to the mall or grocery store or helping your child with their homework or where there's all this input that you have to filter and organize, it can become so overwhelming visually that because the brain can't process all that information or there's dizziness or vertigo or motion sickness when we're on a screen. And then all the stuff we were doing before, we can't do any, we can't do the same at least moving forward. And so really with the right motivation, compliance, with the right work, we can get to a place where we can get back to our previous level of function. Um, but we see so often, especially women aged 35 to like 65, 
told that they have PTSD or depression or anxiety or mental health problems after head injury. And it's, of course, things are different after a head injury, especially when you can't do what you love and get back to your previous life. So I just, I, I hate how often labels are slapped around. You, you all see this all the time from an, infl an inflammatory perspective, from a, um, I mean, the list could go on with, with, with all of you practitioners. So it's just, uh, I think we all need to to know better so we can do better. You said a couple of things here in terms of appropriate age for reading and appropriate age for screens. Ta let's talk a little bit about that. Um, what is, you know, there's so, so much pressure on kids to be reading so proficiently at what seems like a younger and younger age. Mm -hmm. What in your opinion, is an appropriate age and when should alarm bells be going off as far as reading? And then I want to have a whole conversation about screens. Yeah. So, I mean, truthfully, the, the appropriate age for reading is is independent to the child. Yeah. Um, you know, I have a, a four, almost five-year-old daughter in pre-K who they're already giving sight words to. And you know, a lot of parents are like, oh, my kid's reading chapter books and, and and they're four, they're five, and they're really proud of that. And there's a lot of benefits of that. But again, when we're presented with stress, we don't have the tools in place to meet the demands. That's when these, these bad habits form. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think when we were all kids, it was kindergarten, you're starting to put sounds together and you're starting to work at, look at sight words, but not till first or second grade, are you really learning to read? And then- right third and fourth grade, you're reading to learn, you know, bring that at least two grade levels down now. I would say in general, with the absence of screens and everything else, like six and a half, seven is really when we should be visually developing the foundation to support reading. But also, you know, not loading the system too much too quickly. And if we can kind of gradually build on what has been learned, then we keep a positive association with reading and learning. But we also then learn how to string together sight words into sentences and sentences into pictures and pictures into movies. And we can support the cognitive development and the visual cognition that comes with the vision development so they can uh, be in a parallel fashion. Screens, though, I mean, that's that's a whole nother discussion. Um you know, well, let's people... talk about it because I think every person here who's a parent or not, I mean, we've all never relied on our screens more, you know, and I'm, my youngest was in preschool when the pandemic first went in. And I remember they started trying to do preschool on us. And I was like, N no, like, no, this makes no sense. So let's talk about it because it's an, it's a necessary evil right now. And we all want the best for our kids. And we all are faced with this really, we know every practitioner on this call knows the negative of impacts of screens and yet it's a reality. So help us navigate this. Yeah. Honestly, I've been saying this is the new pandemic and, you know, it, it really is true. So you know, the, the visual environments that our kids are living in now are so different than they were obviously when we were kids, but even a generation ago. And screens, of course, are everywhere and they're being introduced at early and earlier ages. When we were all kids, we would be outside all day long and our parents would have to drag us in, especially in the summertime. And now it's the reverse. Like our parents are literally dragging kids outside because they're buried in the basement doing gaming and on screens and on phones. And um, it's a big problem because vision is intended for us to navigate our world and to learn from our world. And so much of our children's worlds are now two-dimensional backlit devices that are blasting this high energy to our eyes and, and to our brains. So you know, I think recommendations, I definitely want to start with that. Um, American Academy of Pediatrics comes out with numbers that, you know, I think the one that everyone, that seems to resonate with everyone is not more than two hours a day, but I would say it totally depends on the child. So, you know, if somebody, if a child's less than 18 months old, they really should not be on screens unless it is for really high quality content. FaceTiming with a loved one who's not present and you want them to recognize who they are and what they sound like. Um, but beyond that, I mean, that shouldn't be, 
it shouldn't be more than that. 18 months to like 24 months, you know, not more than a half hour. And it should be, again, really high quality content. If we're then going age like two to five, not more than an hour a day and five or six and up. I mean, I guess not more than two hours a day, but we really should be balancing as much time as we're spending on screens with at least that amount, same amount of time outdoors and exploring our world and developing our visual system for in the environment that it's intended for. And we should be taking tons of breaks. Um, the, the 20, 20, 20 rule, a lot of people talk about now that that's kind of the maximum. But for those who haven't heard that, um, anytime we're on a screen or anytime we're doing near work for that matter, we should be not looking for more than 20 minutes without taking a break for at least 20 seconds and looking at something 20 feet away. So all my patients probably are annoyed with me, but I have them set timers on their computers or on their phones where at the maximum 20 minutes, you're getting up and you're looking away and, and you're disengaging. And it really should be more often that, especially for, for those of us who are on screens, eight, 10, 12 hours a day. I mean, drink a ton of fluids. So you have to get up and go to the bathroom and kids should be taking movement breaks and getting up and engaging with their world and walking around and, and not really stuck at that one particular distance. Um, you know, I think that the key with this is screens aren't going anywhere, but there is a lot that can be done to offset the influence that these have on, on our children, but also on ourselves. And even though they're in schools now, and, and even though apps and games are designed to allow for that dopamine hit so that we don't want to get away from it, um, you know, we're now seeing that there's negative implications with social development, emotional development, cognitive development, even vision development, where nearsightedness is at a ridiculously all-time high, where it's estimated by 2050, half the population will be nearsighted. And if you can think back to like when we walked on the moon, it was, I think it was about 24 to 25% of our population was nearsighted in America. Back in 9-11, was about 48%. Now the number is so much higher. It's, it's estimated if two individuals are to have a child right now, and both, both individuals are nearsighted, their child has a one in two chance of being nearsighted. If one parent is, a one in three chance. And if neither parent is, a one in four chance. Mm -hmm. And so genetics play a role. Environment plays a role. We can't do anything about genetics. But environment, there's so much that can be done for... Um, you know, setting up the computer system appropriately, having the right visual ergonomics, we can talk about those, but then taking breaks, having the right visual system in place, going through an individualized program to develop the tools to support those demands so that, you know, you, you can thrive in this environment. And in many cases, even digital performance lenses or glasses that are intended just for screens that have a right combination of magnification power, prism power, filters, blue blocking filters, tints. I mean, there's lots of different variables that, um, that should be individually prescribed for, the, for that person. But we can get to a place where you can support those demands with the right intentions and right tools behind us. Um, but if we're just plowing through and, and not getting up and you know your prescription changing every year, that only happens if there's a problem. Our prescriptions should not change, especially after we're done growing. Yet all the time we go to the eye doctors and we're adapting the lens we're in, we're needing something stronger with the same clarity, then we go down the cycle. So I'm going on a rant here. I'm gonna I'm gonna pull back, but there's uh there's a lot we can do. This is this is I mean it's in on in some levels it's depressing, but the fact that there is so much that we can do is actually really encouraging. And I know, you know, with my own kids. Um, we have a very strict two hour max and only a couple of days a week. Are they even allowed that? And it's really interesting. Just they're just better humans on the days where there's zero screen time. Like they're happier. They use their imagination. They play like they do things that kids do. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, on like, you know, on we have Friday and Saturdays, they're allowed like Friday night, we have family movie night and then Saturdays they're allowed. But that iPad time is like they talk about it all week. They can't wait to get there. And then they turn into monsters, right? Like it's really interesting how we're so dependent on something that is just doing so, so much harm. I want to shift the conversation from, from the screens because you talked about, you know, the blue light component. And because we are so heavily visual, 
um, let's talk about the different light inputs. You know, we know the basics, right? Like we know that within an hour of rising, it's really good to get daylight exposure, even if there's clouds in the sky, right? And we know that at night, it's really important to minimize blue light exposure. We want to be sleeping in a pitch dark room if at all possible. But beyond that, can you help us given that you know, vision is really all about light, right? Like how, you know, I'm seeing some questions here about red light as an example, but can you, can you kind of help guide us on how to work with light to our advantage from a visual perspective? Absolutely. So blue light, I love that you said this is not bad for us. We actually need blue light, blue lights in the sunlight. And for everyone who remembers elementary school science, the Roy G. Biv spectrum, R is on the higher end of, of wavelengths with red and then it's infrared and microwave and, and radio. And then the low end is the V for the BIV and then UVA, UVB and X-ray, gamma, all of that. Blue light is, is short wavelength, high energy that from the sun is great, but blasted from a screen all day long is terrible for our brains and for our eyes. And so, you know, we now we don't really have a whole lot of research to say how it damages the eyes, but there's compelling evidence that it absolutely disrupts circadian rhythms mm -hmm. and can be a driving force behind metabolic disorders and, and even some cancers. So, you know, I think that's something that there, we have cells in the back of our eyes that respond only to certain types of light. And when they're constantly overstimulated, it disrupts the sleep-wake uh, signaling that occurs. And then, you know, how your how, how melatonin is secreted. Um, and then that can cause headaches and that can cause just terrible symptoms like heavy eyes, headaches, sleep disturbances, like you shared, fatigue, dry eyes. I mean, there's there are studies that say on average, we blink about 15 times a minute. And when we're on screens, it goes to about a third of that. So about five times a minute. And yeah. there's even an ICD-10 diagnosis called computer vision syndrome that wasn't around a few years ago that is now a cluster of all these symptoms from staring at screens. So, you know, I think blue light filters kind of like gluten. Gluten's not good for most of us, causes an inflammatory action, but for some it's, it's, a, it's a game changer when it's eliminated. Blue light is not good for us, blasted from a screen, but for some of us, having the right filters in front is literally the, the difference between going to sleep at night versus not. And high, you always want to get higher quality. The higher quality filters block a larger range, and the lower quality ones is just like 435 nanometers, which can be called a blue light filter, but it's really a small range. So in terms of lighting, I think lighting is, is really important for kind of a workplace environment and for a computer setup. Um, and I always recommend that, you know, number one, you want to reduce glare as much as you can. Um, and that can be even from as simple as like cleaning your computer screen, which nobody does, or even using anti-glare devices or anti-reflective screens or coatings. Um, the, the paint on the walls matters, you know, having dark painted walls and like a matte finish can be a lot more comfortable for the eyes. Um, you want to have as large of a screen as possible and, uh, and as far away from you as possible. Mm -hmm. So if everybody sticks their arms straight out, the distance between here and kind of your, your middle finger, that's the closest that the screen should be. And you want the top of the screen to be, be about 15 degrees in down gaze. Um, and then even just in the room, like reducing ambient room lighting. So you know, the, the harsh blasting LED lights, it, it's, it's not comfortable for the eyes. It's not good for the brain. You want natural lighting whenever possible. You want to use interior lighting and even like floor lamps with halogen lights that can come over or incandescent and direct lighting options are wonderful. Um, for the brain injury population, those fluorescent lights and LED lights are just terrible. Um, and they can trigger migraines and, and headaches, as many people know all too well. Um, brightness on the screen and contrast, I always say start it at zero and then gradually increase the percentage. But kind of the sweet spot for most people for at least brightness is around like 40 to 65 percent. 
Um, and the night shift mode, if you have an, an Apple device, that's great for blocking certain lights. You can even flip the contrast. So it's instead of black letters on white background, you can make it white letters on black background. That can be really comfortable for a lot of people. So, I mean, knowing that there's a lot that can be adjusted can decrease a lot of the symptoms that come um, with being stuck inside and staring at a screen for too long. And I'm sitting here. <laughs> so I, I passed the, the arm test, although that's only because I'm talking to you right now. If, if, if I didn't, I have my laptop propped up kind of away from me because we're doing this, but normally if I was working, it would be in the wrong place down here on a tiny screen, but I'm just noticing, I mean, we're spending so much time on zoom, which is our new offices. And I'm thinking, looking at all the freaking lighting, we're basically in like a studio setting, right. For so much of what we do, um, which now I'm realizing is so, and I get lazy about it. I just turn it all on sometimes in the morning. Cause I'm like, ah, I'm going to be doing so many zoom calls. I might as well have it all set up after this conversation. I'm going to be turning all of this off between, unless I'm actually on camera. <laughs> so can I give a couple tips? I just yes. gave it. A, uh, a podcast interview on how do you fake a Zoom call so that yeah. visually, so that it doesn't cause problems. Yeah. Um, so a couple things. Number one, try and get a window somewhere mm -hmm. near distance gaze. And as often as you can, even if it's looking like you're pondering what the person's talking about, really look out the window and try and get your focus to be thrown into the distance as much as you can. Right. We can even talk about exercises to stimulate focus from a flexibility standpoint, from constricting and relaxing, but Throw your focus out as far as you can. Um, you can also, and it's it usually takes training to get to this place, but if you can establish a rapport with the inside muscles of the eyes that make things clear, your focusing system, you can literally defocus and kind of place your gaze behind the screen. Okay. Where in some cases, if, if your face is really large on the screen, it may look like you're not paying attention and you're kind of daydreaming. And with your kids, you can tell if they're listening or not based off what their eyes are doing. But the pupil should get bigger when you relax your focus and look far away. And you almost want to look through the screen, almost like a magic eye and diverge the eyes and then come back when you need to. Um, but that can be really helpful. And then even shutting off the monitor, but looking straight ahead you're not going to be engaging with this plane. So you're going to be aligning your eyes as if you're perceiving it farther back, as long as the volume is still on and you know generally where their face is on the screen. This is such great tips. Do you have a favorite, like, you know, those, those apps that do the, that change the colors of your screen based on, um, based on time of day, based on like they have, what's the one I'm going to, I use one can't remember what the name of it now. I think it's Iris. Um, and it has all these different settings, you know, health, sleep, gaming, reading, programming, et cetera, et cetera. Do you have a favorite one of these or do you think some are better than others or really it's just kind of anyone? I've heard good things about Iris. I haven't, I truthfully, have not dug deep into a lot of these. Okay. Um, I saw a uh, an evaluation last week with a professional gamer who estimates he's 14 to 16 hours a day, literally gaming. And his, prescri his prescription has increased about 17 steps in a year and a half. And it literally is, he's stuck here. Somebody's just giving him a stronger, stronger prescription to maintain that demand. And it just is this vicious cycle. He... He's developed, I guess, his own app that changes the contrast and the color or the way somehow his monitor shifts as he's been engaged with the screen for longer. But I mean, it's it's taking breaks, it's taking vision breaks, it's taking brain breaks as often as you can. And, you know, if you were to squeeze your fist as hard as you can, after a few seconds, your hand hurts. But if you let go in order to do this, you could do this for a long amount of time. Focusing muscle behind our eyes is a sphincter circular muscle. So when you're on a screen, it's literally doing this and your eye, your pupils get smaller because it's behind the pupil. And then when you look far away, you're letting it go and, and the pupil gets bigger and dilates and it's relaxed. And so just not having that system under tension can be a key to decreasing headaches and eye strain. And then that's the inside muscles, the outside muscles that control the pointing or the coordination of our eyes, same type of deal. If we can diverge and look through the screen rather than converge and stare at the screen, 
our system is not under tension and oftentimes our, we're leaning in and our neck and our back starts to hurt and we develop these postural problems and you literally see ki kids that are walking around like this or gamers like this all day long because they don't have the core stability and they don't have the the peripheral vision to open up and handle those demands. Wow. Um, so I could just talk to you for hours. I'm sensitive to the fact I'm seeing so many great questions. I want to get to these. I have a couple more for you and then I'm going to go through the questions in the chat. So sure. one question, you just mentioned dry eyes. I cannot tell you the number of clients who have said I have dry eyes and we're sort of trying to, is this a hydration issue? Is this a fatty acid issue? So it sounds like this is tied into functional vision and absolutely to screen use. So simple. Absolutely. And, and I would say at a minimum screen use exacerbates dry eyes. Mm -hmm. But one of the most, com I would say one of the biggest secrets of dry eyes is omega threes. Mm -hmm. So we have three layers to our tear film. The outer layer of our tear film is called the mucin layer. You, if you up the omega three concentration or even start taking it if you haven't been taking it, it allows that layer to be thicker and more viscous. So your own tears don't evaporate as quickly and actually are protective and stay in your eyes for longer. So, I mean, in general, you know, I think omega-3 fatty acids are fantastic for so many aspects of health, but especially for, for the tear film quality and then for dryness. Um, but again, remembering to blink. I mean, there's people that even need um, alerts to blink because remember we're blinking at least a third as often when we're on the screen. And dry eye is something that should not be happening for young, healthy people, yeah. or really for anybody for that matter. But, you know, if we look at it as kind of like watering the, gra the grass, you can put drops in your eyes to water the grass. But you got to hit it from the fertilizer perspective, too, and really enrich from down there. Um, and anything that says gets the red out, like Visine, mm -hmm. please do not take. That actually makes things worse. It constricts the blood vessels. Hmm. your eyes don't look as red, but then when the drug wears off, there's a rebound effect of twice as much because the blood vessels are red to try and bring more oxygen in. Sure. And it's an unbelievable marketing ploy that they've had to make you dependent on them. And then you just keep coming back for more. That's it's too. so interesting. This I can remember years ago, this was my first sort of dabble into what you're talking about many, many years ago, long before I became a functional health practitioner. Um, I was talking with an acupuncturist who is also an optometrist. And he was saying, this is like the only profession where someone comes in with a problem, you give them a solution, which is eyeglasses, which you know is going to make the problem worse, right? Um, and is um, And they're gonna come back a year or two or six months later. And they're like, yeah, now I need more. And they're happy about it and totally okay to pay more money to get this, you know, like it, it's, it's a problem that continues to compound and the solution is literally contributing to making the problem worse. And no one, like you think about sort of any other industry. I mean, that was, you just, that's not, that's not how we clients do. wouldn't come back if they weren't getting healthier. Right. Like it, just, better. it doesn't yeah. make sense, but it's, it's totally like that in this industry. Well, and it's, um, I care is reactive. It's not proactive totally. and it's treating the symptoms and not even acknowledging what the problem is. Right. So crazy. I want to bring it home before we open up to questions to something that I've heard you talk about. And I know there's a connection and everyone here is going to be delighted to hear more about it because we start with gut healing and hidden food sensitivities as the root cause of inflammation. Can you help us make the connection between gut health, inflammation from food sensitivities, and our vision? Inflammation is the root cause of everything, as you all know all too well, <laughs> um, especially for somebody recovering from a head injury. Food sensitivities can be the worst trigger to symptoms and inflammation within our body manifests within the visual system with blurry vision, brain fog, headaches, lack of mental clarity, lack of visual clarity, inability for the eyes to work together as a team. And I always say, even for, for a TBI population, if we're not addressing systemically what's occurring, and although there's brain inflammation and neuroinflammation and the blood brain barrier is often compromised. If we're just addressing the visual component and we're not addressing systemically what's occurring, especially within the gut, 
their ceiling is dramatically lower in terms of treatment. And, you know, I think what we, that's why I'm, I'm just so honored to be here today. What you guys, what you all teach your clients in terms of the right ingredients for your body to function, that is so necessary on so many levels. And to not have that foundation in place really just limits your ability to function from all aspects, but especially from a visual standpoint. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We've got so many questions. I'm just going to go straight up to the top here. Um, okay. Sorry, my, this is actually my screen jumping around, not my eyes. Okay. <laughs> um, my chat was going crazy there for a second. Um, Morgan is asking, I'm curious what you see in practice after traumatic brain injury. There are a lot of connections between the gut and motility post injury. Are there things that we can do to help these patients with eyesight, like at home exercises or vision? She corrected it once you, once you'd made the distinction. <laughs> Love it. Um, so yes. Yeah, so I think from a, there, there's so much that can be done for at-home exercises, but in in many cases, especially with the brain injury population, it can disrupt how they're compensating and almost leave them in no woman's land or no man's land where, you know, if the disorientation or motion sensitivity or sensory overload is, is a unconscious response to the brain and the body to disengage and a pull back. And so commonly with a head injury, we get this rivalry or competition over sensory input where the brain picks one eye and ignores the other and literally ignores a chunk of space, something called suppression of binocular vision, where that limits the ability to see in 3D, but is a conscious decision at an unconscious level over which eye to use. So, you know, I think the biggest thing with brain injury is slowly introducing screens and near engagement and slowly introducing sensory input, because if you jump into the deep end too quickly, there's a huge setback. And we have a lot of programs in place to help people return to reading, return to learn, return to screen engagement after head injury. But I think giving the brain the right supplements in terms of how to um, give it in the right consistency, what it needs to heal and allowing healing to occur is amazing. Getting outside and going on walks and really opening up periphery can be really helpful. Um, and then there's usually some sort of disconnect between the visual and vestibular systems. Then the vestibular system is kind of internal orientation system and the roadmap of life that lets you know which way is up and down and left and right. And after head injury, that orientation system and the visual system are sending conflicting information that the brain can't process. So, you know, to answer your question, I think there, there definitely are exercises that can be done, but I think if too much is done, it oftentimes creates disequilibrium and symptoms get worse. And then if there's a path to come out of that with the right treatment program, absolutely, then the start at home and then we know where the solutions are there. But if if there's not an individualized office program with home support or a practitioner who does this type of work, I would say it, it's in many cases better to kind of hit the foundational stuff first before we're hitting vision. And foundational being gut health, reduction of inflammation. You mentioned supplements. And I know And the next question here is about DHA. DHA um, so back to that fish oil, but tell me in addition to the fish oil, and I would love to hear the dosing recommendations, um, but other supplements that are your favorites for recovery from TBIs. Yeah. So, I mean, this is going to sound awful to say, but it, it's almost like you can't even have too much DHA. Mm -hmm. um, there's a neurologist that has done, that I work closely with, who's done a ton of research uh, in the omega-3 space for traumatic brain injury. Uh, I don't take his recommendations, but he recommends for anybody who's had a head injury, whether it was six days ago, six years ago, a loading dose of nine grams for two weeks, and then six grams after, I think that's crazy high. I think that's way too much, but it lets you know, you know, as long as there's not contraindications for DHA and omega threes, your, your body's probably not going to absorb all of that. Yeah. Um, I usually recommend about a thousand or so milligrams twice a day is kind of the starting point. And then we can know we can raise it or lower it if we need to. Um, in my kind of brain boosting bundle, I always recommend omega threes, um, curcumin, ashwagandha, Ginkgo biloba, 
um, CoQ10, and then magnesium. And magnesium, there's lots of different types of magnesium. Magnesium 3 and 8 is the one that um, can cross the blood brain barrier and is way more beneficial for head injury than uh, the other types of magnesium. And really, you want to give your you want to give your brain a high dose of what it needs to heal itself. So supplements on top of lifestyle modifications and meditation and, you know, the right support system and infrared sauna and depending on how crazy you are and how uh, set you are on recovery, you know, hyperbaric oxygen, there, there's lots of different options out there. Um, but very often vision therapy is the missing piece uh, to, to head injury recovery. Awesome. Shira asks, how does this overlap with brain reorganization and reflex integration? So uh, primitive reflexes are have gotten a lot of attention lately. And primitive reflexes are reflexes that are we're all born with that are retained from a protective standpoint. And then through our life experiences and developing the ability to use our body and to develop these sensory systems, the need to retain them uh, eliminates unless we are not on the appropriate developmental path and hitting all the milestones the way that we're supposed to. So very often retained primitive reflexes can prevent a child's ability to, uh, to thrive in so many aspects. But very often, if we look at the work we do as kind of teaching somebody how to use their eyes to retrain their brain, very often by accessing the right centers of the brain and getting them to communicate Appropriately with with the centers that are needed for the particular task, the need to retain a primitive reflex uh, disappears. So you can treat primitive reflexes indirectly with the right um, functional vision problems in place where it's often not even needed. And then when it is needed uh, from an occupational therapy standpoint with developmental optometry, with physical therapy, with speech and language pathology, with lots of different um, collaborations, you, you know, those are no longer needed to, from a protective standpoint. Fascinating. So many follow-up questions, but we're just going to keep moving here. Cause I want to make sure we answer as many as possible. Um, what is your opinion on pinhole glasses? If you're familiar with it, can you tell us why it works? Uh, so, so there's, uh, certain disciplines within eye care that have been around for 150 years. Uh, there's a, a famous um, ophthalmologist named Dr. Bates from like the 1900s early who developed, who wrote about some of his protocols that some certain people still swear by. Uh, he incorporated pinhole glasses. So pinhole glasses, what they essentially do is you're looking through a really small little dot that isolates one little area of the retina. And in some functional vision problems, it can make it so... Um, you know, an a adaptation to lock in to see more clearly no longer emerges if you wear those all the time because you're literally blocking out all this noise. But for anybody with pinhole glasses, when you're isolating the sweet spot of, of the retina, the, the macula, which is kind of the center of the bullseye, the 2020 zone, every that gets really sharp and you don't see anything else. So it's basically helping the, those help the brain filter central and peripheral information. And if learning were to take place from wearing them and, you know, we could have them on the right amount of time and, you know, that could be beneficial, but for most people, it's literally just putting glasses on and not letting you see much other than little spots of light. And I'm sure they've helped some people some, but if they were as fantastic as certain people from hundreds of years ago, years ago, still promote in their writing, then it would kind of be standard of care everywhere. Right. So I think there's other uh, strategies and techniques and, and devices that are a lot more effective than pinhole glasses. Okay. Laura asks about motion sickness and I'm seeing others wanting to do, if you can talk a little bit more about how vision is involved in motion sickness. So about 80% of motion sickness has a visual component that's treatable. And most people, when they hear that, are like, what? How has this not come out before? Some motion sickness has to do with inner ears disease or Meniere's disease and is not vision related. But the motion sickness that would manifest as it's worse when you're in the back seat 
or if you're reading or on a tablet or you have to be the one driving. Mm -hmm. uh, very often what happens is that's these two different pathways in our, in our brain that are almost in like a tug of war with each other. One that responds to our central focal vision and the other responds to our peripheral ambient vision. So when we're all in a car, our vestibular system, that system we talked about, the orientation system gets activated to say you're in motion and you're seeing all these trees go by and your body is saying there's stuff going on around you. If you're then driving, you can actually access periphery and open things up and have that system override. But if we're then in the backseat and we have the headrest in front of us not moving or we're making really careful, intricate eye movements when we're reading or on a tablet, we're then allowing the seesaw to tip between central and peripheral. And literally these two systems start to freak out with each other. And so many kids, especially facing backwards in a car early on, I mean, there's yeah. breakfast, lunch, and dinners all over the car. I'm sure a lot of people in here have experienced that. Um, the vast majority of motion sickness can at least be improved, in many cases, dramatically improved. I would say in general, we should not be on tablets or phones when we're in a car, driving or a passenger, whereas humans are not meant to do that. You can get to a place where you have the right integration of that central and peripheral processing systems where you can handle that or read on a subway going sideways, but it requires really careful feedback and learning and integration of these systems to be able to um, function at that high level. So we're at the top of the hour. Um, Bryce, I just want to check in. It's late where you are. Are you okay to go for a few more minutes and answer a few more questions? You got it. Only for you though, Margaret. Oh, thank you. I won't, we won't go too long. I don't know that we're going to get through all of them. I keep seeing more questions pop up, but um, as Susan's asking about cataracts, can you address cataracts? Yes. So typically anybody who lives long enough is going to get cataracts and cataracts, is, it's the lens on the inside of the eye that becomes cloudy as we age and kind of like the windshield of a car. If you're looking through a cloudy windshield, it's hard to drive. It's hard to see. So for most people, it's usually late 60s, 70s, early 80s. Uh, but there are certain types of cataracts that certain people are born with. There are certain cataracts that can emerge early from steroid use systemically or um, certain drugs or diabetes or certain things where um, the lens gets cloudy, the proteins cross link, and then it becomes a uh, really, it can become a health issue. Even cataract surgery today is, is the number one most common surgery done in the U S you're in and out pretty quickly. And they can actually take that lens out. And if you have a prescription or you have difficulty seeing at a particular distance, they can put an implant in that allows you to actually see clearly without the assistance of, of glasses, which is pretty cool. Um, there's a, particular company called C60. I don't know if anybody's heard of C60 here, um, which I'm experimenting with myself and with a, a large number of my patients. Yes. And early reports are out that cataracts have slowed down progression and in some cases decreased with C60. Wow. And I'm saying that not as supported by any research or literature, just what, what we're seeing. And if that is in fact true, that's a game changer. Um, but definitely, you know, ways we can slow down cataract formation and macular degeneration and just uh, disease processes from speeding up that are avoidable. UV protection when you're outside, great for slowing down uh, the damage that can occur from UV rays. Um, for macular degeneration, not smoking. That's terrible for so many things, but especially for the back of the eye and lots of antioxidants and vitamins A, C, and E are really good for scavenging, uh, the, for the free radical scav scavenging in the back of the eye. Wow. Amazing. That is game changing. I know C60 and I've seen great results. That's, that takes it to a whole other level. Might need to get them on here. Um, what are some common causes of strabismus in children who were not born with it? Oh, thank you so much for bringing this up. Um, I'm going to try and talk quickly. This is a very emotional topic for me because I have so many friends uh, with kids with eye turns and eye turns are more common than ever now. So the majority of eye turns 
Is that um, what strabismus I, is? Is that the- Sorry, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah. strabismus is a medical term for an eye turn. Okay. Uh, amblyopia is a medical term for a lazy eye. The, uh, the brain not learning how to see 2020 or equally with that eye. So the majority of eye turns or strabismus have nothing to do with eye muscle strength or length. They have to do with coordination of the eyes together as a team and our brain problems showing up in the eyes. So a child who walks early or skips over crawling has a significantly higher likelihood of developing strabismus or amblyopia because it hasn't developed the bilateral integration, the using both sides of the body, the core stability to then act as the foundation from which we then learn how to develop our visual system. So if the world goes from being static to all of a sudden dynamic, and we don't have, we have this fragile eye coordination system, we end up picking one eye rather than using both together. Or a child who reads too early or is on a tablet too early, vision is learned. If we haven't learned how to use our eyes as a coordinated team, then it's a lot easier to have one eye be straight and have the other one drift out. From a strabismus surgery or on an, a surgery to in an attempt to shorten or lengthen one of the eye muscles, best case scenario is a cosmetic cure that where they look straight. Almost never is there a functional cure where depth perception emerges because depth perception, like we talked about, is learned. You have to learn how to use the eyes together. And we would never have knee surgery without doing physical therapy before or after, yet in so many scenarios, vision therapy isn't even discussed after eye muscle surgery or before, or as an alternative. And in so many cases, you can dramatically decrease the need or even dramatically increase the success rate if we have a functional system in place. Amblyopia, which we mentioned is the medical term for lazy eye, old school treatment for that is, is patching. And I'm sure all of you have seen children and adults walking around with patches on. It's literally from hundreds of years ago. And we now have the research and literature to support what my profession has known for a long time. And that a lazy eye is a, is a two-eyed problem showing up on one side. And the old school methodology was there's a good eye and there's a bad eye. So let's cover up the good eye so that the bad eye has to work. And then you're walking around life like this. But this is a problem where this eye hasn't learned how to see in the presence of both eyes because the brain is always picking this bossy eye. So unless we can arrange the conditions to teach the brain how to pick this eye in the presence of both eyes, when you patch because of a fragile coordination system, it's actually harder for the eyes to work together and the eye turn emerges. So patching is literally outdated unless there's a huge discrepancy between eyesight where you can barely see the big E on one eye and then the other eye is fine. And, you know, high technology these days, like virtual reality, we can literally create a world where it's equally as blur on each side or, or the contrast is equally the same or we're setting a scenario where the brain has to pick this eye because under two eye conditions, it never would do that. And then active learning to take place to learn what it feels like, what it looks like and the depth that occurs when you're using both eyes versus when you're not to then develop the new cells and pathways that are there. So most eye muscle surgery can be avoidable and most patching is not needed and actually makes things worse. Wow. This is just so good. And I, we literally could stay here all night. I want to respect your time. I want to respect everybody's time here. Can you just, as we wrap up, can you do two things? Can you help us understand the different, just a super fast, the different, cause there's ophthalmologist, optometrist, vision therapy. Like I want to understand the different things and yeah. how do we learn how do people connect with you how do people either work with you if you're accepting people distance or how do people find practitioners like you in their communities got it so simple as ophthalmology and optometry mm -hmm. ophthalmology are trained on intervention of eye disease and on structure and they're the ones doing surgery if you need a unique diagnosis or the cataract removed that that somebody brought up before that you see an ophthalmologist mm -hmm. Optometry are trained on um, function and development and how the right types of prescription. And I have lots of friends who are ophthalmologists who would say, 
Never would I tell a patient to go to an ophthalmologist for glasses or contacts. Always go to an optometrist. There's so much more training there. Okay. And optometry would say for surgery or managing glaucoma or medical problems, mm-hmm. go to ophthalmology. Okay. Um, and then there's opticians where if you go to like Warby Parker or eyeglasses stores and they're uh, people train how to just measure glasses to fit appropriately and maybe make the lenses. Um, my specialty with uh, vision therapy and rehabilitation is a subset of optometry. Uh, COVD.org is the College of Optometrists and Vision Development. That's an international organization that board certifies doctors in vision therapy and rehabilitation. You can type in, there's a located doctor session. You can type in a search radius and it'll give you a list of all the providers within however long of a radius you set. Uh, You definitely want to see somebody who has the letters FCOVD after their name, which means they're a fellow of the College of Optometry and Vision Development. They're board certified. You unfortunately don't have to be board certified to do vision therapy. And especially now with the attention that vision therapy has been getting with just how many vision problems are across the board and and children in particular and head injuries, we're now seeing OTs and PTs and teachers doing vision therapy because it's it's so needed. I would argue the level of care is dramatically different with somebody who's board certified versus those who are not. Um, From an evaluation standpoint, you're in good hands with somebody board certified from a treatment standpoint, there's not a whole lot of consistency on what vision therapy looks like. And that's something that uh, I'm putting in tireless work right now to try and change and going to be creating uh, some programs to train doctors and we're rebranding what we do. Uh, And this can be the first group to hear about it in something called Vision First. Uh, The new website is going to be myvisionfirst.com. It's going to be out in a couple months, but with the premise of when healthcare has let you down, you need to be focusing on your vision first. And that's going to be this umbrella uh, brand that's going to launch a lot of what we're doing now um, and have everything fall underneath that. So right now we have uh, concussionclear.com, which is a uh, wonderful landing page, just all about head injuries and, and concussion and ways to work with us. Um, we see a lot of people from out of state or out of country who fly in for intensive boot camps, uh, evaluations, lots of treatment, and then we put them on home programs until they can come back again. Um, and then we obviously see a lot of local people as well. Um, we have a, uh, a program called Screen Fit, which is a wonderful um, vision wellness program, a vision training online program designed to transform your tired, strained, blurry eyes and turn them into HD vision. It's kind of like a workout program instead of for your body, but for your visual system to be able to stare at screens with more productivity, less symptoms, um, and to develop the systems to support a lot of uh, the screen engagement that's required from life now. It's a simple 10 to 15 minutes a day, one new lesson a day. Uh, It's 30 days in a row. There's two different phases of it. We've gotten incredible feedback from our beta test group. And we have a lot of a lot of big organizations who are enrolling all of their uh, employees or clients within them. So um, everyone here, we have a, uh, a, a coupon code set up so that you can get 10% off uh, with enrollment. It's at screenfit.com. And if you use uh, the code RWS alumni, that will give you 10% off and everyone can try that. And then if anybody does want to become affiliates, um, let us know. And then you can actually on, on the website, there's a place to, that you can click to say become an affiliate. Uh, but we have lots of functional medicine practitioners and, and even standard uh, normal eye doctors who uh, have patients going through this. And it's kind of like doing sit-ups, air squats, and push-ups at home, a home workout program for your body, but instead for your visual system to be able to get to a place where at least symptoms are a little better and in many cases, dramatically better. Amazing. And then also you can find us on applebombvision.com uh, and on social media and all of that as well. And your your Instagram tag is Dr. Bryce Applebaum? Yes, uh, D-R-B-R-Y-C-E-A-P-P-E-L-B-A-U-M. Uh, we spell our last name Applebaum oh. with E L just to make it hard for everybody. Sorry about E-L, that. E L, sorry, I, I did it. I, I wrote E-L Applebaum of vision, yeah, inc- incorrectly above. I'm putting in the um, IG handle. You guys need to, at the absolute minimum, go follow Bryce on Instagram because his reels are so informative. 
Also, I'm just going to use you as a little mini case study here. When you started doing Instagram, like, was it even a year ago? It was actually, I think that it was, it was when we met in Park City. In Park City. So you had Sorry, like ago. no followers. The, you're I mean, probably just the started first it. one. You're probably, and, one the first well, probably one of the first 10. <laughs> and like, how many followers do you have right now? I mean, 20 uh, some thousand now. Okay. Now I just want everyone to hear that. And do you know why that is? I'm going to tell you why that is. It's because Bryce regularly puts out amazing, just totally valuable content. It's not high production or anything like this. It is literally Bryce talking into his phone, explaining the concepts like he's doing here, but just in little tight segments. So not only should you go and follow him because you're going to learn a ton about vision and continue this conversation, but I want you to watch what he's doing because just as a business strategy, he has done a brilliant job going from nothing to 20,000 practitioners or followers on Instagram or 20, 27, however many tens of thousands of practitioners. Well, can, can I followers. add to that? Thank yeah. you for the love. But honestly, we see people now coming to us for care from Instagram and yes. never have thought that was even possible. And now it's like, oh, which reel did you see that, that caught your eye? It's crazy. I, I am. I just, I just think I, I, when we have, a, we have a lot of conversations here about business building. And, you know, as we all know, Social media is a mixed bag in terms of love-hate relationship with it. And I just think you're such a brilliant example of just getting out there, doing it regularly, sharing really valuable content, and it's the consistency and the value, and then and look at what happens. So fantastic job on all the things. Thank you so much. I know this is late. I've just, we've just totally, your kids are little. This We just missed a bedtime window. I'm pretty sure maybe that's I don't it's know, not always a bad thing though, right? No, I was going to say, it's not always <laughs> a bad thing. So you're welcome. And thank you. Thank you everybody for coming. This is, oh, this is fantastic. Great night, everyone.